So it sounds like you really need solid tools and support to make this work. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how do you, how do you train people up uh, to get them to feel comfortable? Because even when you're at work, you run into an issue, you can just call IT and over, or they come over and they'll fix your, they'll fix whatever's broken. When you're at home, it's a different, different story. So it is a different story in terms of um, having people to, 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 to fix little things here and there uh, that you might encounter from a technical standpoint. You don't have that. But um, I don't know who, who you have IT people who come to you when you've got problems, Brian. I got a, um, secret, number. I got a secret number I call. <laughs> I know you're special. See, Brian, Brian's got all the, all the, the beloved Brian, but no, the thing about it is uh, remote work is a different skill. It's a different skill for individuals. It's a different skill for leaders and managers. Um, number one, the number of contact that you have as a manager with individuals in your um, kind of sphere has to go up particularly as people are trying to figure out how to work in this new format. So if you're used to meeting with people at, at, at a certain number, I would increase that, maybe mm -hmm. even twice as much. I would check on people to see how they're doing, how they're coping. So send a note, send an email, just ask questions. How's it going? Are you doing okay? Are you getting set up uh, in the way that you want to? One of the things that um, I'm hearing about is that some people have laptops, they have monitors, they have easy access to the resources that they need in order to begin their work from home, but others don't. Managers need to identify those issues and they need to find ways to resolve them. Mm -hmm. So. Even if people don't have access to laptops, you have to make sure they can have um, a way to dial into their systems. How do you do that? Can you get loaners for people? Can they have ways to dial into their systems, VPN systems? What are the ways in which people can have access to their resources, their work in order to participate? You don't want to create an environment where you have haves and have nots. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is you also don't want people to feel like they have more access to you as a manager um, than others in the group. Because in the absence of objective, true information, the bubble of a people's mind starts to go crazy and people imagine the worst. So it's a period where you have to over communicate. You have to feel, um, people have to feel your presence a lot more than usual. And you have to make sure that people are in tune with the big picture because they've been extracted away from work yeah. and they're now in their homes. They need to understand what's happening in the organization. The economy is starting to shift. They need to understand how to respond to customers and clients or whatever stakeholders uh, who themselves might be grappling with shifts and changes. And it's up to you to make sure that they feel connected uh, as well. There's now, also, yes, yes, yes. I, I was going to say a lot of our listeners you know, may not be in management positions. These might be, you know, people who are rank and file yes. workers and they're trying to grapple with this too. Yes. Just as it's important for a manager to sort of double down on communication with yes. their team. Would you also say it's important for a team member to maybe at the end of the day, shoot a note to your manager and say, hey, here's what I just want you to know. Here's an update on a few things I was working on today. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wouldn't even wait until the end of the day. I might even start the beginning of the day uh, to even say, these are some of the things that I'm working on thinking about. Um, these are the, some of the challenges that uh, I'm concerned about. And, 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 um, uh, engage people because at the end of the day it might be too late to solve some issues. So um, getting getting um, uh, some guidance, some insights uh, early could be very helpful. The other thing is um, people need to communicate more than usual. So you might send an email, uh, but you might also go, get on Slack um, and uh, replicate that uh, uh, communique or um, 
uh, summarize and, and send some form of redundant uh, communication. Yeah. Um, and so you, you really have to over communicate and check in a bit more as an individual contributor as well. I think that's very, very important. And managers will appreciate it because believe it or not, people are trying to figure it all out. And it feels like it's a period where um, uh, there are more questions than answers at all levels of the organization, internally and externally. So individual contributors doing their part, trying to reach out to, to their leaders. It's a fabulous thing to do. Yeah. Now, I have a question that's a little bit, maybe more a little bit in the weeds. But if you're a manager and let's say you've got a team of 15 or 20 people and you're trying to run a meeting online, uh, like how do you how do you manage that? How do you have a, enough presence there to be able to orchestrate that kind of a conversation? I think it's a very important question, uh, actually, because running virtual meetings uh, are different than running face-to-face -face meetings. First and foremost, it's it's very important that you set some ground rules, explicit ground rules that people follow. Mm -hmm. Part of those ground rules has to do with making sure that people are paying full attention, have people turn off devices. So ask people to turn off their devices when the meeting begins. To you made me do that started. before we started our conversation today. You made me turn off my stuff. Uh, yes, <laughs> you, you, you saw that, right? I said, I turn off all of your devices, quit, 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 uh, your email, et cetera. You don't want those to start ringing, right? right. Um, second thing is you want people to make sure, you want to make sure that people are not multitasking so that there are present and paying attention, not only to you, but to, to one another. And you want to set those uh, norms as well. And so you want to make quite explicit um, that part of uh, those ground rules. Third thing is you want to make sure that everyone is participating in kind of an equitable way. So you want to invite every member to participate and you want to make explicit that you want airtime to be shared and you want to say that explicitly so that everyone understands that they're invited to contribute because it's very easy to recede in a remote conversation, much easier than in a face-to-face -face conversation, believe it or not. And so you want to set that expectation. Fourth and finally, one of the things that we have found makes a difference in a virtual conversation is to spend six to seven minutes at the top of the meeting to not go straight to business. Mm -hmm. It's to almost create the water cooler conversation as mm -hmm. part of the structured meeting, is to invite people to share a bit about uh, themselves, their day, how they're doing. It could be anything that you're interested to hear about. It could be, how are you today? How are you handling? How are things? How are you adjusting to working from home? It could be our safety moment, depending on who you are and the culture of your organization. Uh, but go around and invite people to, to share how they're doing so that you're um, inviting kind of a personal informal moment. And as you do, invite those who may be on a, a lower status uh, uh, side of the group. Lower status meaning, uh, you know, people who may be new to the group, not people who are established to the group. You know, I just joined the team. Or it could be um, someone who just joined the company. Uh, uh, just invite those who may speak less uh, usually, have them begin and do that and then you can jump into your agenda yeah. start on time end on time and people will trust you and you know one of the things that i'm hearing you go back to again and again is this notion of really taking the time to kind of double down on the on the communication aspect of this to let people know you know because you don't have a you're not walking by them in the hallway you don't have an opportunity to say hey how, how did your kids game go last weekend that kind of thing but finding the time in the room to continue to make space for those human connections that, that we know are so important in a work setting those human connections or we call them informal contact they were first identified in the 1950s believe it or not 
directly contribute to the performance of groups. And that's one of the things that you lose when you are working from home or working remotely. First thing that goes, the water cooler conversations, or as my friends in Europe say, the cappuccino conversations, <laughs> whatever you want to call them, the first things that fall off are those, the informal contact. And so you're constantly finding ways to recreate them. By the way, the other thing that goes away is kind of the face-to-face -face, uh, contact. And which is why the video calls, like the one that we are having right now, matter. Yeah. Find some kind of way to see one another uh, is really important. We know not everyone can do it. You may not have the, the, the tools or the technology or the ability to do it all the time, and you may not want to do it all the time, but to try to do it maybe even once a week is super important. But those who can do it on a regular basis, I really recommend it, especially with these background things. You don't even have to clean your house. <laughs> That's great. Look, I've got time for a couple more questions. This one is a little bit more specific to a function, but for people who work in roles where it requires them to meet with people outside of the organization, let's say you're in a sales role or you're in a product management role and you've got to go out to where the client is and all of a sudden you're being told you got to cut back on that, you know, uh, essential travel only. Yes. And, or maybe the organization isn't letting people in. How, how do you grapple with something like that? Yes. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a question I've been getting uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's um, not a very uncommon question right now, but I think it's no different than the question that I just answered, which is about you try to replicate what you would do in a face-to-face -face scenario through technology, which is video calls. Yeah. I would absolutely vi do video calls. You can't wine and dine. For right. sure, if you're in sales, you cannot wine and dine, but I would do video calls and I would do one-on-ones as opposed to one too many because you want to build rapport, you want to build connection, you want to um, uh, create a, a trust uh, uh, um, uh, a trusting relationship with someone else. You want to create a personal relationship with someone else. So. What one of the things that we've learned, and I'm talking about decades of research, is that you can develop trusting relationships with others that is equal to the trusting relationship that you build in face-to-face -face relationships mm -hmm. online, just like the one that we're having right now through these conversations. Exact same relationship. Uh, 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 quality of relationship, trusting relationship, but it just takes longer. Yeah. So for salespeople, uh, for example, who now have to build these relationships through these types of mechanisms, it's just going to take longer for them to do it. So people have to recognize that, uh, but they can do it and they can do it fully. Yeah. And so um, it's just a matter of um, uh, um, more contact, longer contact that can all be done it can all be done through these mechanisms and i think today people are nervous they they'll appreciate uh, the um uh, mediated calls as well yeah i think you're right and i think you know for sales people that are that are listening to us they might get the edge on their competitors because they're going to take the time that they need to to really you know nurture that relationship so i've got i've got time for one more say doll if you'll stick with me for a second sure. you know we're, we're, we don't know where we are in the coronavirus, you know, uh, pandemic, we're, what stage we're at. We know it's with us for a while, and here, you know, at, at Harvard at least, we're ready to buckle down on this and, and expect to be in this for the next few months. But do you see this potentially as a catalyst that sort of propels us into a new acceptance of this kind of remote work where we've been a little hesitant for all the reasons we've talked about today. We've been a little hesitant to take that step. Does this sort of force us in a, in a good way to sort of make that leap of faith? I absolutely think so. I think if, if there's anything positive and hopeful about all of this is that for us at Harvard, for many organizations around the world, is that it's pushed people to begin to develop this repertoire of remote work or to work in kind of a decentralized, distributed way and forcing people to develop 
uh, the skills in uh, um, in this in this in this medium or the the mechanism by which to get it done and to get it done well. Mm -hmm. So people might not have chosen to do it this abruptly in this kind of anxiety producing kind of way. But I think the good news is that this could be an added repertoire for individuals and organizations that um, we may use in the future. I don't think that the world is going to move in this direction wholesale, nor should they, because uh, at the end of the day, the the face to face contact is the gold standard right it's the most human way to be with people to break bread it's pretty fantastic mm. but we also know that you can have an equally effective relationship online relationship with people and be just as effective the world over and this is one of the ways in which i think we're all being forced to learn, to grow, and to increase our repertoire around it. So this is one hopeful thing about this process. And, and maybe at the end of the day, every single person who's being subjected to this, an organization will say, ha, huh, we've now increased our repertoire. We can now do a little bit more. And I yeah. think that's hopeful.